I think we'll get started. Um, I know that some people are still out in the foyer. Uh, we're doing glucose testing out there, and that will slow some people down. But we will start now because we have some at-home viewers who are watching us live with our webcasting, and we're welcoming them as well as everyone who's here tonight. I'm Nora Kane. I'm the director of the Stanford Health Library, and I'm happy to have you here this evening for our second um, great program on managing type 2 diabetes tonight. The subject, as you can see, is diabetes and exercise, and we have two speakers, which will only enhance the experience for all of us. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Baldeep Singh. He's a clinical professor of medicine at Stanford. And our second speaker is Dr. Kathleen Wasowski. And she's a senior physical therapist in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation at Stanford as well. So uh, just so everybody understands how we um, run these programs. If you haven't been here before, uh, our speakers will do their presentations, and then we open it up to question and answers um, afterwards. So I'm going to just, at this point, welcome you and also welcome our speakers and let us get going. Thank you. Dr. Singh? Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I'm an internist. I'm a practicing physician at Stanford. Um, so I deal a lot with uh, patients with diabetes, and so I thought we'd start because I know that there's varying levels of uh, knowledge and give you a little primer on, on diabetes and then move into some of the issues around exercise. Um, <clears throat> so what is diabetes? Diabetes is a disease where the body cannot make enough insulin and therefore the sugar goes up in the body. So currently, uh, for those of you who've been to the doctor, you'll get a report from your doctor typically. I send these out to patients all the time. That Tell, uh, uh, tell you what your fasting blood sugar is, and that's a normal blood sugar is between 70 and 110. And so your physicians may give you some advice around that sugar, because as the sugar starts to creep up, they may tell you that um, uh, I'm a little concerned your blood sugar is going up, and that means that you're creeping towards potentially diabetes as that number rises. So typically, we like most patients below 100 fasting blood sugar. So for those of you who've been to your physicians and see that that number is a nice number below 100, um, that usually makes us happy and brings a big smile to our face. Uh, when you're between 101 and 125, that's considered borderline diabetes or prediabetes, which means that your body is not uh, able to regulate the sugar quite as well. It's struggling a little bit more. And then... Um, by definition, the definition of diabetes is when the fasting blood sugar is consistently above 126. And we'll talk about glycosylated hemoglobin in a minute, but uh, typically a glycosylated hemoglobin um, over 7 is considered diabetes, 6.5 to 7. Um, if you're, uh, uh, so we try to use the fasting because it's the most consistent blood sugar. After eating, the blood sugar can vary, and that's why the physicians usually don't like or don't rely on the sugars after eating. And uh, the glycosylated hemoglobin, which I'll show you a picture of in just a moment, is a um, average three-month sugar. So the problem with sugar is if I check your sugar right now for the next hour, it will be vacillating a lot with, with many kinds of things, with food, with exercise, which we'll talk a little bit about. And so it's very hard to get a good sense of what your real true blood sugar average is uh, by just checking blood sugars. So we, uh, a number of years ago, someone discovered this thing called a glycosylated hemoglobin. And we'll come back to the slide. But es essentially, a red blood cell here um, carries a little bit of sugar on it. The higher your sugar is in your body, the more sugar is on that red blood cell. And a blood blood cell is unique in that it lasts in the body three months. And then your body sort of chews it up. So it's a, a good reflection of where your sugar's been averaging over a three-month period. So the reason the physician are, uh, we as physicians like to measure it is it's a very good reflection of the average. And going back a little bit, um, the number you can see for your average sugar correlates with the A1C quite well. And so we use that as a much better gauge of where someone's sugar lies on average than just the numbers that you check in one instance, which are less accurate. So you can see on the right, the more glucose that runs in your body, the more that sticks to those red blood cells, the higher the glycosylated hemoglobin. And so I tell people it looks like kind of a donut with a glazed sugar on it. And uh, we use that analogy for, for many reasons here. Uh, the more sugar on the red blood cell, the more higher the glycosylated 
hemoglobin and the poor or the control of the diabetes. So just briefly, uh, there's th a number of types of diabetes. We always talk about type 1 and type 2. 80% of people, uh, that is say the vast majority of you who are diabetic, would be type 2 diabetes. And the pathophysiology of that's differently, but, but, but the bottom line is that the um, body does not process the insulin as well. We call that insulin resistance. And it is correlated with weight and with exercise. So the reason that you hear that there's an epidemic of diabetes in this country right now is because uh, as your weight goes up, your ability to process insulin is impaired, we call that insulin resistance, and your sugar goes up. As you lose the weight, your insulin is actually able to be processed better and your sugar comes down. So as the population gains in weight, we will see more diabetes. Uh, type 1, which is the kind that we see in juveniles or kids, juvenile that type of diabetes, is the kind where your body attacks your pancreas, typically, and produces no insulin. And those patients have no insulin from the very beginning, and they require insulin, whereas 75% of type 2s can get by with pills. So only a small percentage of our patients with type 2 diabetes actually require uh, insulin. There's a few types of rare diabetes due to medication. Um, that I won't go into. And then pre-diabetes is that range that I was telling you, well, you're not fully diabetic, and there's not strong evidence that we need to put you on medication. But that's the phase that we're really going to push patients hard about changing lifestyle, which is the focus of today's talk. Really getting that diet intervention and that exercise intervention in place, because if you change the trajectory of your diet and exercise, you can reverse the course of that, and your blood sugars will come down, and you can get out of pre-diabetes and potentially diabetes. So what are the signs of diabetes? Well, typically, we hope none of these things ever happen to you. We're not trying to make you diabetic, or rather, we're trying to catch you before you actually get these symptoms, I should say. So in the old days, when we didn't have good blood sugar, ch blood sugar checks like we do now on the, sh on the blood test, and we didn't have A1C testing, um, people would come into our office with these types of symptoms, extreme thirst, extreme urination, blurred vision, drowsiness, nausea, hunger. Um, and um, I also work in one of the free clinics that Stanford runs, and we'll typically see these patients show up in our underserved population because they don't have access to good health care, and they'll present, present much later in the disease, typically when they're overtly uh, uh, diabetic. Typically, their sugars will be to over 200, whereas most of the time when we're watching our patients closely in the clinic, we'll pick uh, patients up long before they become, uh, get to sugars that high. Uh, why do we care about blood sugar control? Well, um, uh, it helps maintain body health and nutrition. It lowers your risk of infection. Poorly controlled diabetics um, have higher risks of infection. It increases your energy level. It increases the body, uh, patient's, the, rather, the, uh, the, the body's uh, ability to heal. And most importantly, and the reason we care about this most in medicine, is that uh, diabetes leads to four serious complications. Uh, kidney problems. Um, vision problems, uh, heart and blood pressure problems, so it increases your risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attack and stroke, and nerve disease. So um, as we as physicians try and, and our healthcare teams try to impart on you the approach that we take to diabetes early on, we try to get people to, we call it the ABC approach, which is um, the A for attitude, that's you wanna have a good attitude towards trying to improve your lifestyle, B, blood sugar glucose measurement with your physician or at home. C, controlling the glucose of medications if necessary. D, diet, and uh, I, uh, we could spend a lot of time on diet, but, but uh, suffice it to say there's a lot of we could say about uh, diet and, and low carbohydrate intake. And then uh, E, of course, is exercise, and we'll talk a little bit about exercise today. And finally, F is fortitude, that is the strength, because this is not easy what we are asking you to do as physicians. We're really asking you to really change, in many cases, uh, a lifestyle that you've led for a long time, and that and behavioral change is by far the hardest thing we as physicians need to tackle. So why is exercise good? Exercise lowers blood sugars during and after exercise. It helps insulin work better. It improves blood sugars and fat profiles. It supports muscle maintenance and conditioning. It improves a sense of well-being and quality of life and decreases fat weight. So. For, for, for many of physicians, we would say that one of the most important things you can do um, as you uh, get older in life is to exercise because it really has almost all plus and no minus side. 
So how does uh, exercise help in preventing type 2 diabetes? So I tried to sort of just pull a few studies um, to look at this. And so a meta-analysis of 10 studies looking at physical therapy. Now, this is in pre-diabetics. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, so we're trying to delay diabetes. Shows that regular exercise uh, can, can, should, can uh, d decrease the onset of diabetes. And in a prospective cohort of uh, study of men, either weight training or aerobic exercise for at least 150 minutes uh, per week was associated with a lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes than no physical activity. So by doing, when you're in that intermediate phase, as I was telling you, that pre-diabetic phase, a lot of times we as physicians and our staff will be telling you to start these interventions because you can reverse the course of your um, trajectory because if you continue to gain weight and you continue to remain sedentary, the sugar will go up and up and up. Then you'll start a medication and it'll go up and up and up and then you might need something like insulin. And then those uh, effects that we mentioned earlier on the eyes and the heart and the kidneys will start to take place. And uh, tackling that early will really uh, often prevent diabetes from coming on. And so we really try to push people early on in that intermediate phase because that, at that point you can really make a difference. Once you're full, a full-blind diabetic, it will typically help, as I'll show you in a minute, but, uh, and we can decrease the amount of medication. We, may, we may, be able, may not be able to get you off medication. So engaging in physical therapy is um, when you actually have type, type, diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes. Again, we see that there's both a decrease in blood sugar based on a number of studies, and your overall A1C, that measure that we use, actually goes down. So we see an improvement in the control. And what does that mean for the diabetic? It means less medication, means potentially delaying insulin. It means better control. And so people are able to then get by with better control of their diabetes without having to take more medication or potentially insulin. What's the best uh, kind of exercise? I'm not going to spend too much on this. I know um, uh, my next speaker here is going to, uh, Kathleen's going to talk a lot about that. But in general, um, ex all exercise is good, um, and the more exercise is probably better. And I think one of the keys would be consistency. You want to be consistent in your, in your regimen, particularly if you're on medication. We even like it better at the same time of day because you're able to regulate your blood sugar a little bit better if you're taking medication, if you try to do the, the exercise at the same time of day because then you can be a little more consistent in, in um, your eating patterns and your exercise patterns. So a reasonable regimen might be 10 minutes and then building up from them until we hit that 100 to 150 minutes that we were talking about earlier as an ideal goal for most patients. So uh, one of the things I like to, we like to do as physicians is try to make what's called SMART goals. So I want you to think, as Kathleen talks a little bit about, specific things that you might do, specific changes, something that's measurable, something you can time, something that's attainable. Don't try to shoot for the moon, but make an intervention that you actually think you can do tomorrow and stick with that's reasonable and timely. So it's much better to make small incremental changes and be consistent with them than make a huge change, run a marathon tomorrow, and then do nothing for the next rest of the year. And I'm going to reserve the questions till after Kathleen's comments. So we're going to do a quick computer switch here. I apologize for the audiovisual issues here, and then uh, we'll take questions at the end. So I'm Kathy Wasowski, and a lot of people hear all the time about exercise. And most of the time when people say, oh, you need to exercise more, this is what a lot of folks think, or something a little more along those lines. Um, how many people here exercise regularly? Wow, very exciting. All right, how many want to be able to exercise regularly, but somehow life just sort of interferes? Okay, a few more honest people. And how many people know they should exercise and just really don't want to do it? No one who's willing to admit it, but um, if you were to talk to physicians about exercise, they would say this would, and you were able to put it in pill form, this would be the number one prescribed pill simply because it helps your body to run more effectively, more efficiently just like getting that car engine turn, tuned up. One of the um, interesting things Dr. Singh was talking about a number of different studies, if you do seven hours of activity a week, you can reduce your risk of dying early by 40%. Dr. 
those are some pretty good numbers compared to the folks that are just sitting and growing roots onto their sofa. So there's a lot of different improvements that you can do in your health. You can improve your energy levels. There's wonderful research showing that people with all kinds of diagnoses of different chronic diseases do much better activity-wise and feel better, improve sleep quality, obviously muscle strength, that's why people go and work out at a gym. And with that increased muscular strength, it will allow you to do a whole lot more activity. Helps you recover from injury better, helps with relaxation as well as making you feel more energetic. Wonderful studies showing that exercising on a regular basis can help improve depression almost as much as medication. Helps improve cognitive function, especially if you're older. We all want to be more smart upstairs. If you have cancer, it helps to improve your general fitness level, helps to improve energy, and helps to improve mood and quality of life. So those are all some really good things there. And there's a few more things that it helps to reduce risk of. And Dr. Singh spent some time talking about heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes risk. All are dramatically less. It definitely helps with insulin resistance. So as a diabetic, that's what you're more interested in. Most of us for the um, aesthetic benefits, we're interested in reduced fat, as, especially in the abdomen, but it also will reduce your risk of osteoporosis, helps to slow down your weight of bone loss, which will help prevent hip fractures, and because your muscles are stronger, you've got better balance, helps to reduce falls, helps to reduce chronic pain, helps to reduce stress. This is the one I'm really interested in, is it reduces your risk of Alzheimer's by up to 50% even if you start exercising in middle age. Since I'm in my later 50s, this is a very important thing. It reduces your risk of breast and colon cancer, prostate, endometrial, and lung cancer, not quite as great a research, but by 20 to 50%. Cancer recurrence and early death. So you're going, okay. Maybe it's not just all about diabetes, but how much exercise can I get away with? You know, what is the minimum I have to do? Well, the CDC says you have to engage in moderate intensity physical activity for 30 minutes, five or more days a week, okay? Or you can choose to engage in a more vigorous activity level for just three days a week for 20 minutes. Well, how hard is vigorous? How hard is moderate? Well, if you are doing a moderate level of activity, you can talk, you're a little bit out of breath. You should be a little out of breath because you're moving, you're actually working. It's not like just someone ambling along, but you're not able to sing during the activity. Sounds sort of silly, but it's a good way to let you know. Are you working hard enough? Vigorous activity, you're not going to really be able to do more than just a few words simply because you are working hard. These are the folks that are running. These are the folks that are playing singles tennis. One thing that helps those of us who are not particularly athletically inclined is physical activity and exercise are perceived as the same thing by your body. So you can go ahead and you can mop the floor vigorously. You can be out there raking the leaves and your body still feels that that counts as exercise. So a moderate level of exercise, your heart rate should be 50 to 70% of your maximum and vigorous is 75 to 85% of your maximum. Now, how do you find what your max heart rate is? That's 220 minus your age. So for a 50 year old person, you would be, if you're in the 50 to 70%, you'd be at about 85 to about 119 for your heart rate. And in the vigorous activity, it'd be 120 up to about 145 for that. Another way for those who are not, a lot of times people have a hard time finding it on your wrist, really easy is find your Adam's apple. Everyone can try that and you just slide your fingers backward and to the side a bit and usually you can feel your heart rate bumping along and especially when you're doing some types of activity that's a much easier way than trying to find it somewhere on your wrist 
but the rate of perceived exertion is another way. Now, researchers use a 1 to 10 scale or even a slightly different numbered scale, but a lot of times people have a hard time saying, well, am I a 6, am I a 7? This is a very cool one. One, I can exercise all day. This is easy. Two, this is a little bit hard. I can keep doing this for quite a while. Three, this is moderately hard. I'm going to have to stop eventually, but I can, I'm feeling out of breath. I'm feeling like I'm really doing some good work. Four, very hard. I'm not going to be able to keep doing this forever, that's for sure. Five, I have to stop right away. So that's a really easy way for people to sort of check in on themselves and say, well, how hard am I exercise? If you think, okay, I'm going to be sweeping the backyard and I'm just sort of moving at a leisurely pace, that would be more about a two. If I'm moving much more briskly, I'm finding I'm getting a little more out of breath, that would be moderately to very hard, depending on how heavy and wet the leaves are. So moderate intensity activities, a lot of day-to-day -day stuff, washing your car, vacuuming, ballroom dancing, general gardening. All of these, your body thinks, count just like going out for the walk, going on the bike, which is going for the more vigorous intensity things. So heavy gardening, that's if you're continuously digging. One cool thing the CDC has also found is 10 minutes of moderate exercise is exactly perceived the same as doing 30 consecutive minutes. So you can do three groups of 10 minute exercise. First thing in the morning before you go to work, you can go out, do your vigorous, brisk walk. It's cold, so you're definitely going to be walking a little faster. You can go for a walk during lunch, and then you can go ahead and um, play a little ball with your kids, and you know, soccer with your kids in the afternoon after you get home. So it's very nice for people that either have issues with pain, my knee really won't let me go for that 30-minute walk, but you can do three 10-minute walks spread out over the day or issues with endurance or just time. A lot of us have very busy lives. It's harder to fit in 30 consecutive minutes or we think it's harder, but this is certainly a way to get going and still get those same benefits. There's four main types of exercise. The first one, and this is the one that really makes the biggest difference in your health and diabetes in general, is aerobic exercise. And these are the things that keep your heart rate up for sustained amounts of time. And that's the important thing. It's sustained time that makes your body, instead of just burning sugars only, it will start burning fats. And that's why most people are really very interested in that for the way it helps us look. And that's one of the reasons why this is much better for losing weight. Strength and resistance training, this is going out to the gym, lifting weights, using elastic bands, like I've got some elastic bands over here, doing sit-ups, doing squats, all of those things. Another nice way to take your aerobic workout, you've done 20 minutes on the treadmill, you want to get a little bit more activity in, you can go ahead and do exercising with weights for an additional 10-15 minutes, and as long as you're doing them at a slightly brisker pace, you're staying at that, yeah, I'm breathing a little bit faster, okay, my heart rate's still staying up, in order to keep that going. This also helps your body to become more sensitive to insulin. It helps to really build much stronger muscle, and that's what most of us perceive of as, okay, I'm going to go and build muscle bulk. But the great thing is when you have bigger muscles, they help to burn more calories. So if you have someone who, if you measure their muscle mass in their leg, even if you have two people who both weigh 140 pounds, one person may have a lot more fat and another person has more lean muscle. The person who has more lean muscle will end up burning more calories at rest, which again will help with your long-term sugar control. Flexibility and stretching, 
We all know that if you watch your typical cat or dog after they've been sitting down for a while, they get up and they stretch. And this is the kind of thing that usually helps us to continue to feel better. We don't get so stiff. Most of us, our lifestyle tends to be fairly sedentary. We sit a lot. So stretching can be very helpful. Classes like yoga, tai chi, and pilates involve a lot of stretching. One great advantage of going to classes either at a gym or the Y or the local community center is it helps you to get into the habit of exercising. You join a community, you see your friends there, which will help you to continue with this whole exercise habit. Balance is absolutely critical for safety, especially if you have peripheral neuropathy, as Dr. Singh was mentioning, the long-term effects involve sort of marinating your nerves in high levels of sugar over time. They, you have a hard time feeling your feet. You have a hard time with controlling your balance with these muscles in your feet. But you can do a lot of very simple things you can do, like the drunk test. You can walk sideways you can go ahead and just stand on one foot. If you have difficulty with your balance, you wanna make sure that you are standing near something stable as you first begin practicing these things. So how do you get started with all of this? You've convinced me, I gotta, gotta get you going. You have to ask yourself honestly, where are you these days as far as fitness level? None of us is 20 anymore. You may have rode crew in college, but not recently. So I'm mostly sedentary. I don't really get a whole lot of exercise, except for things like housework and yard work. You know, I'm, when I mop the floor, I get a little bit warm and sweaty. But this gives you an idea of where exactly you should start. Finding an activity you like to do or something that you dislike less than some of the other things and finding a buddy, someone that you create a contract with each other. Okay, eight o'clock Tuesday morning, we're gonna be there. And that way you both feel sort of a commitment to each other and that will allow you to keep going. When you get started exercising, you want to make sure that you are not increasing your activity level a whole lot at one time. A lot of times people say, well, gee, I went for a 15 minute walk. That felt great. I'll go for an hour the next time. And then as Dr. Singh was mentioning, we get the big crash and burn. So 10% every few workouts so that you can gradually keep building on it. We want you to be successful and to feel like this is something that really works well for you. If you're having pain, try modifying how long you do it, how much resistance you do. Try changing a little bit what you're doing, what time of the day. Um, but if you have continued pain, do let your doctor know. And of course, physical therapy can be very helpful to help you modify exactly how you're doing those exercises. Maybe find something that works better for you or give you customized exercises to help with those particular aches and pains. Dr. Singh was talking about the SMART goals. Um, that's a great way to do it. So the more specific you wanna be, the easier it is to maintain staying on track with those goals. So what activity are you going to do and for how long are you going to do it? How often and when are you going to do it? So if you can plan out for all of these variables, it's a lot easier to get rid of some of those excuses that are floating around in the back of your head going, oh, I'm too tired. Okay, I will walk briskly for 10 minutes during my lunch hour, three times a week. That sounds like the, something that's pretty attainable and sustainable. You get a walking buddy, you might end up going for a half hour it, during your hour lunch break. So is it realistic? And again, as Dr. Singh mentioned, starting small always works a whole lot better. Starting and failing exercise programs. If you go to a gym, oh, about January 5th, gyms packed with people by about March. 
You know, it's just no one's going because people go there, they work out for an hour, everything hurts. Nah, this exercise stuff isn't for me. So we are much more interested in starting with a level that you know you can do. It may even seem really stupid and easy, but I would much rather that people did stuff five minutes a day, every day. Five minutes isn't much, but being very consistent and getting into that whole habit of exercising um, so that pretty soon your body goes, you know, this moving around stuff is really feels good. All right. I've got a really hard time with fatigue. You've got other medical issues. And this is something that I deal with a lot. Most of the patients that I see have a lot of chronic pain and a lot of very major medical issues. So check with your doctor first. Make sure that this is really something that he wants you doing. Um, like I said, playing tennis may not work well for you, but I have a gentleman who just had a kidney transplant who was playing doubles tennis up until the week before surgery. You know, wasn't able to do a lot of running around, but found that if he paced himself and went nice and slow, made it much easier. Brief walking in the neighborhood, if you're having a lot of pain, a lot of fatigue. This is what I tell my patients, it's called drive your neighbors crazy. So you start out in front of your house and you walk two houses down piece of cake. Come back, walk two houses back this way. Okay, I'm getting tired. I'm going to go in now. But you've now walked past two and two, walking past your house a couple times, and then two more. You've walked past 10 houses, but you've only been two houses away from your home. So for people that are afraid of, gee, my back pain really bothers me. What if I get on the other side of the block and I can't get back? This is a really nice way to start improving your exercise activity. Your neighbors really won't think you're that nuts, but um, if you're just too exhausted to exercise, I'm a firm believer in the something is better than nothing. If you are having a difficult time doing stuff, doing exercises in your chair, doing exercises in your bed, there is a wonderful series of exercises called Sit and Be Fit on PBS. Program's been going on for over 20 years. You can get DVDs. You can um, go to KQED or KCSM, and they have wonderful stuff for exercises for people who have a harder time doing stuff. Stronger muscles actually help to improve your fatigue, though. So if you have a six-year-old kid and you ask them to carry a gallon of milk around the block, that's going to be pretty hard for a six-year-old kid. Okay, because the six-year-old kid doesn't have a lot of muscle. If you ask his 16-year-old big brother to carry the gallon of milk, he could probably carry a gallon, probably two, around the block, simply because he has bigger, stronger muscles to allow him to do those activities. So people that have a hard time getting up off of low toilets and off of low sofas, we need to give to help you to grow stronger muscles so that you can do stuff. Small bites, bites of time and activity, great for helping you to get in the habit. I happen to have a little pedometer. I've walked just since I walked out to my car to come here. I've already walked over 950 steps. So it adds up fairly quickly on my normal work day because our department is huge on a really slow day where I'm doing a lot of sitting, I walk 5,000, and on a busy day, I walk up to 8,000, and that's just at work. So you can do a lot. Aerobic housework, as I mentioned, doing the same things you have to do, just doing it a little bit faster, getting your heart rate going, walking a little bit further than needed, not parking quite so close, parking further on out. Um, the elastic resistant bands st or standing exercises during a commercial break. I had one patient who had severe heart and lung issues that said, you're not going to be able to get me to exercise at home. I know I just won't. We convinced her to take the elastic band and she would microwave her frozen meal 
at lunch and at dinner. And while it was on the microwave, she would sit down and she would do things like, here you're getting some cardio, an arm bike. And she could work on these exercises in these very small bites of time. And actually she ended up doing a whole lot more than she expected because it was easy to get going. Bicycle peddlers, those also work very nicely because you can put it in front of the sofa, do some exercises. You don't have to have a big um, bulky machine. So we're going to all do some exercises. Everyone stand up, please. You didn't know about that, did you? <laughs> So these I call touch and goes. What you're going to do is you stand in front of your chair and if you are getting up to go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, you get up, you do that. But before you sit down, you go and let's have everyone sit down. And if you can, just touch down and back up or as close as you can get. And we'll do that three times. And then the last time, oh, you can collapse in the chair. But by doing that, you have given yourself the opportunity to work in dozens of squats during the day, just slipping it in. Another exercise, everyone take your left foot and lift your toes up, and then straighten your knee out in front of you. And let's see if you can hold it for 15 seconds. So this is stretching your hamstrings and your calf muscles working on your thigh muscles. Again, those are ones that you need to help you get upstairs and get up off of that low sofa. So you hold it on that one side for 15 seconds, then go ahead and do the same thing on the other side. Easy to do while you're watching TV. Little things to just start getting your body moving a little bit more. Okay, balance exercises. Standing in front of the kitchen sink on one foot. You can do it while you're washing your hands if your balance is pretty good. Um, if you are having more difficulty with your balance, you do want to have something that you can hang on to. If your balance is pretty good, you can do all kinds of exercises, high stepping, side stepping while you're watching TV, waiting for the show to come back on. You can progress to standing on a folded towel. Something as simple as this, if your balance is already pretty good, this gives you a somewhat unstable surface and you can do things like arm exercises standing on the towel to make it a little bit harder, okay? Now, the American Diabetes Association has some very specific guidelines for diabetics and exercises. So sustained moderate exercise helps to lower blood sugar levels, as we know, but when you intensely exercise, sometimes paradoxically, your sugars go up. So when you first start exercising, it's really important that you check your sugars both before and after. Um, you want to always make sure that you're carrying some type of easily absorbed carbohydrate with you because since you are burning off these sugars, we want you to be able to avoid the crashing. So as Dr. Singh was also mentioning, taking your medications, taking your exercise, taking your meals at similar times allows you to have less problems with the crashing. Be careful if you do take insulin, exercising right when you're peaking because you're more likely to have a lower sugar Having a medical alert bracelet um, can be very helpful and make sure you hydrate well. Adjusting your dose of insulin or your medications may be necessary if you find that you still keep having problems, but you and your doctor can work on that. Um, if your sugar does go down, you may find that you, in, after you take your carbohydrate, you should wait at least 15 to 20 minutes before you try exercising again. Um, 
so he was mentioning some of the high blood sugar symptoms, low blood sugar symptoms. My husband, who's also diabetic, he said, uh, this is like the seven dwarfs you have. Hungry, sleepy, shaky, sweaty, grumpy, headachy, and then dopey because you sometimes feel a little bit spacey. So these are some, <laughs> right? Helps you to remember them. <laughs> okay. Um, so if your sugar is too high, you check your sugar and it's 190 before you get going. Um, you and your doctor can help to formulate a plan. At what point do you need to not exercise and actually maybe adjust your insulin levels? But if you are producing ketones, you know, which you can check with your urine test, don't exercise then. But find out, you know, keep track of this so you can see how your body reacts. Peripheral neuropathy, as I was mentioning, can be a huge problem. Generally, low impact exercises work great. If you're doing anything that's very high impact, very sustained exercise, especially if it's very hot or very cold. If you can't feel your heat, uh, your feet, and it's 100 degrees outside and you're walking with something with a thin-toed shoe, you can have some problems. So, we want you to keep the exercise habit going. We want you to find a way to start to be motivated and to get motivated. As I said, something is better than nothing. Don't yell at yourself, oh, I'm a failure, I blew it again. Please don't do that. Just skip the guilt, restart exercising. Um, as Dr. Singh was mentioning, this is a long haul type thing. Attitude matters. Um, Keep reminding yourself of why you're doing this. You're doing it so that you can feel good, not just because the doctor's nagging you. You want to do it because you feel good. And if you weren't successful, don't give up. So everyone stand up. We're going to do a couple very quick exercises, and then we'll be opening up for questions. Um, these exercises, you, everyone got that little slip of paper so that you can access these exercises in a good general exercise routine. So everyone, if you have balance problems, please hang on to the chair in front of you. But otherwise, just lift up your knees straight in front of you. If you don't have balance problems, practicing this will also help to improve your balance. Okay. Hang on to the chair and without kicking your neighbor, you can alternate kicking your feet side to side. Try not to do too much wobbling. Pull, if you pull in your tummy muscles, that will also help your hips to move better. Again, be kind and polite to your neighbor. Um, I can use elastic band or I can just use my hands. And if I pinch my shoulder blades together, Oops, sorry. So this is good for strengthening your posture muscles and stretching at your chest. Since our eyes and hands are in front of our bodies, we're always doing stuff bent over, so that's very helpful for that. And then opposite arm raises, where you raise one arm up and the opposite back. Again, for stretching out the chest muscles and strengthening our shoulder blade muscles. So we want to make all of this important to you. We want to make it enjoyable. Please keep moving. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, um, Is there a connection between exercise and cramps? Muscle cramps? Um, there are exercises that you can do for muscle cramps, um, especially if you do, I... Just still on? Yes. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. You can go ahead and do the typical runner's stretch, and that oftentimes is very helpful. If you have cramps at nighttime, doing it right before bed can be very useful. Yes? Does it make a difference in your blood sugar if you eat breakfast before or after you walk in the morning? Okay. So I'm going to repeat all the questions yeah, sorry. that are being taken. So, uh, you know, probably... is, is your blood sugar, does it make a difference to your blood sugar if you walk before taking it or, no, if you eat breakfast before you walk? Um, yes, yeah, so I think what you're asking is when's the best time to yeah. exercise in relation to, to food?
right, and in the morning, we would probably say that in general we like food in the system because typically what's happening is that you're going to wake up a little bit on the low side, and if you uh, don't put a little something into your system, you might get hypoglycemic. And so it doesn't mean that you have to eat a lot, but it, eating, just getting up and going straight to the exercise may cause some hypoglycemia. So in general, we don't necessarily want you to fill up with a ton of food because then you'll cramp or get, uh, get a bellyache, but putting a little uh, something in your system before you exercise is probably the safest bet. Yes, sir. What exactly is the mechanism that glycose uh, damages blood vessels and nerves? Is it is it similar to the glycolation of the hemoglobin? So that's an extra question. The question is, how does the glucose actually damage the cells? And so what happens is that we know a lot of things. Um, I'm not sure I can tell you the exact mechanism, but it's the high blood sugar. It's the really the, that at high levels of glucose, that high level of glucose is toxic to both blood vessels and, and nerves over time and causes inflammation. I can't tell you the back exact mechanism. Maybe my colleague, Dr. Kenny, back there could tell us, but I'm not sure I know exactly. But it's the high blood sugar that causes the toxicity. You yes. mentioned the paradoxical increase in blood sugar after heavy exercise or very strenuous exercise. Is that problematic? Should that Strenuous exercise be avoided? Not necessarily. What sometimes? The question, the question. Okay. She asked, "What happens um, when someone does heavy exercise and the blood sugar goes up? Does that mean you should avoid the heavy exercise?" What happens is your liver will has a store of short chains of sugars that it is easily available and will break those down. However. When you are exercising heavily, your body perceives this as stress. It produces a hormone called cortisol, which causes your body to, okay, there's a problem, let's get more sugar in the system, and so your sugar may go up. Ultimately, your body will get used to it. You may need to just ramp up your activity level so that you get accustomed to um, so maybe not going out and jogging, even if you feel like you can physically, if your sugars are going bonkers, going so fast, you may find that alternating walking and jogging and then gradually increasing the, per the percentage of jogging is what will allow you to tolerate that and have sugar levels that stay at a more normal level. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. A drug like prednisone, steroid, how that does impact the diabetes? So that's a question uh, was about prednisone. So uh, <clears throat> I kind of briefly alluded to the fact that there was a third category of diabetes where some people take certain kinds of medications of which steroids are the most notorious. And prednisone uh, can make either a diabetic much worse or take someone who's non-diabetic and make them transiently diabetic. Um, and so... The, the diabetes during the time that you aren't prednisone, so people take prednisone for umpteen diseases, um, but would, you would need to be treated during that period of time uh, on the prednisone a little bit differently. So often we'll have to intensify treatments when patients take steroids. Yes, sir. Is there any significance to always having yawning episodes of the beginning exercise? Episodes of yawning? That may, um, this gentleman asked, um, finding he yawns a lot when he exercises. That may be that sort of sleepy, it, your blood sugars, if you were to check them, may be starting to get a little bit lower, especially if you notice some of the other symptoms associated with that. It may be simply that your sugar levels are going down a little bit more quickly and that's <coughs> one of the reactions to that. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so where will the videos for the talks be posted? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the question was where are these videos going to be posted. Perhaps one of our organizers uh, can, Mark, can tell us. The videos will appear on the Stanford Hospital YouTube channel, and you'll be able to find them uh, there, or you can come to the Health Library website, um, which is healthlibrary.stanford.edu, and um, we have them there as well.
Okay, Nora was saying that they can be post, they will be posted on the Stanford Hospital website on YouTube and also will be available at the Stanford um, Health Library. Sorry, one more, yeah. My other question was, um, is there a Spanish, like, kind of um, form of this class that's offered anywhere locally? Um, in East San Jose, because um, I'm bilingual in Spanish, there used to be something, this was a number of years ago, I can certainly see if I can translate this into Spanish. So, um, and I believe someone over on this side had one other question. Oh, yes. It wasn't a question. I, um, my husband and I take a class through Stanford Medical Health called Strong for Life. Mm -hmm at the Avenida Senior Center in Palo Alto. And mm -hmm. a lot of the exercises you showed here, they do in that class. Yep. And it's basically strength and stretching so you don't fall. Correct. Right. And um, it's free, and I don't know if people know that they can take it and it's free. Or I don't know all the places it's offered. All right, she was mentioning that Stanford does have a free exercise program go, called Strong for Life that goes through many of the similar exercises where the focus is improving functional strength and balance, and that is currently offered over at the Avenidas. I would say just one thing about that, and that is <clears throat> um, exercise is more fun when you're doing it with other people. And Absolutely. also it reinforces the behavior if you're doing it with someone else because that person will reinforce you to get out of your chair and go do the exercise with them. So um, trying to find a uh, an exercise that is with other people in the form of a class or with a buddy is a good way to reinforce the behavior. Okay, so everyone's got that. Um, any other questions? There's one or two other things. I mentioned sit and be fit. Um, a lot of libraries have many different videos available. Um, bottles of water, elastic bands like this, very inexpensive, easy for exercise. Adjustable cuff weights can also be used if people are interested. Instead of going out and buying a lot of different weights, you can see in here that you can adjust them by a half pound each. Um, these are the ones that I stole from my husband. And I mentioned these pedal exercisers. Unfortunately, the cheap ones tend to be very cheap and very flimsy, but I use this on a daily basis on my kitchen counter for arm exercises. So it's just something that's convenient to use. Oh, the pedometer. Um, yeah, you can get, just walking around in here, I just did another 50 sets. Um, you can get those very easily. This is a very simple one. This is a Stanford one. And each time I take a step, it clicks. And so um, that way it will tell you how many steps you take during a day. And that way it will sort of give you, oh, I didn't walk that much. I'll just walk down to the corner and back so that I get my you know, 10,000 steps in today. But it's just a nice way to help you, remind you to stay active. Is that a brand? Nope, you can get these at any sporting goods store. They're very inexpensive. This is under 10 bucks, I believe. That's true. Um, um, yeah, this one Mary gave to me, so <laughs> don't have a whole lot else to say. One, Sorry. One, uh, so the questions were a little bit about the pedometer, and, and one nice Sorry. thing about the pedometer would be that um, it quantitates the amount of exercise. So there's this. Uh, thing that this mantra that we're using, which is the 10,000 steps that we're trying to get people to do each day. And so by doing, by having a pedometer, at least you can quantitate a little bit of the exercise and your change in exercise over time. So it is a useful uh, device for those who, who are trying to track their exercise over the course of a period of time. One, I think we'll make it one last question. Is that okay? And, and then uh, we can, we'll stay after for a few minutes for anybody who has questions at the end. Go ahead, ma'am. The TheraBands, you, um, they have them for 10 to $15 at Sports Authority. Um, Big Five does not carry them, but Sports Authority does. You can also get them at online as well. 
All right.